All right. Hello, everyone. We're back. This is actually, this is the first version you'll see, but this is actually the second version because the internet hates us. Uh, we're joined again by Mitch. Hello, Mitch. Mitch is back. People who've watched the show before know Mitch. Mitch is a real deal ling linguist, PhD. I am not a real deal linguist. Therefore, whenever we do any sort of hardcore linguistic episode, we bring on Mitch. And Mitch was very nice and found, uh, basically found the topic uh, for this week. Um, there's a, uh, we're going to be discussing and reflecting on, I guess, um, this uh, academic presentation. Uh, link is in the description below. So you all who at home, if you if you really want to, torture yourself for about 45 minutes you can watch it uh or you can just take our word for it um we're going to be discussing a talk that was given two years ago in the height of covid when all conferences went online um from um nicholas subturello who is at georgetown university georgetown this is not some small you know crazy weird uh technical college somewhere it's georgetown uh so this is sort of the it seen as kind of the height of the field of linguistics now it's it's a it, there's there's some real cred cred there uh and why is that notable well because this is what the next le this is what next level linguistics looks like now this is the title of the talk um I, re I i'm quoting here corpus linguistics in solidarity with struggles for justice colon keeps going a methodological reflection on using corpora to examine and critique ideology okay titles should not be this long i am just going to say you should not title presentations like this um but anyhow this was a talk given two years ago um and it is about corpus linguistics and well so we should probably uh mitch we should do a quick definition of that in a few seconds what corpus linguistics is and then um jump into how this according to this gentleman supposedly connects to solidarity with struggles for justice um yeah lots of fancy words um but maybe Mitch, just just tell us, uh, tell us, uh, tell us how you found this. How how did you stumble across this shining turd of a talk? Uh, so yeah, back in twenty twenty, um, as you said, when when things were a lot, everything was virtual. Um, I, I was suggested and and slash invited to attend this virtual conference that I ended up not attending, but. I was reading through some of the abstracts um, and this one jumped out at me because, you know, as soon as you see something like in solidarity with, it's like, okay, what is this? Especially in the field of linguistics, because it's like, we're supposed to be doing science. So I'm not sure what's going on here. So I read the abstract and there was a line in the abstract that just made me, my, my mouth fell to the floor. It was like, it said something to the effect of, and I don't have it in front of me. So I but something to, and we'll get into this because he obviously talked about presentation, uh, uh, linguistics and or science in a way. We should reject the notion that, that linguistic research should be um, neutral, ap apolitical and unbiased. And that statement alone should be like, what? <laughs> um, so I kind of forgot about it. What well, I mean, that always stuck with me, but I forgot about it for a year and a half or so until I went, wait a minute, that was during COVID. I bet it was recorded. And so I, I went hunting for the, for the actual video and I found it, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And I had to share my pain with someone else. <laughs> and I guess, you know, the, the nice Lutheran in me, despite how much this thing pissed me off, this talk, um, you know, this is not a, I, I have, you know, I'm so, I, I do mean this. I did genuinely mean this. I'm certain Nicholas Santorello is not, it seems like a nice guy. It truly, it does not, I'm not, it's not a personal attack. It's just attack on like, you know, I think his ideas are really bad. I think the talk made no sense. Um, I wasn't, I, I don't even think it was internally consistent, but I, well, I just want to preface by saying, it's not like sort of a personal attack. I just, you know, at the same time, if you're, you know, who are we? We're like small fry. You're at, you're at Georgetown. Uh, you know, you're going to put your ideas out there. Be prepared to get the critique. Here's the critique, uh, you know, for the, for our, our, and our two viewers will agree. Uh, that, that, but yeah, it, it's just, I'm kind of, is for me, I guess, um, I was kind of embarrassed for him. If something like that, I'm like, oh, it, it's clear that he is, I think, very well intentioned. I, I don't think he has malintent. Maybe you disagree on that. That's fine. Um, I think he wholeheartedly believes this stuff. 
and you know, I can respect somebody having enough gumption to put their ideas out there. I just think it's pretty much wrong in most every sense. And it's, I, I don't think it's linguistics. Um, and whatever, I'm not the real linguist and I would never, I'm not a real linguist. I, I do kind of something linguistic adjacent. Um, philology is a little different, but I mean, I hang out with linguists such as Mitch. Um, I've worked with linguists. I've done, you know, um, publications, peer reviewed publications with linguists. I have many colleagues who are linguists. I respect linguistics. I like linguists. Um, but I just, I, I'm kind of, I was, you know, it's about a 45 minute long talk and it just, I would kept waiting for the linguistics to happen. I mean, obviously there's some, some ideological differences, some sharp ideological differences, but you know what, you can derive a lot of, um, I think you can derive a lot of benefit from listening to people that you don't agree with. I, I, and you can learn things from them and you can, you can, they can make some good points sometimes. Um, but I kept waiting for like the real linguists, linguistic point to happen. And it just kind of, I never really, um, that's sort of my overall take is it never really happened. I got to, we got to hear a lot about things like, there was a lot of um, sort of jargon. Uh, there was a lot of like appropriate phrases, um, things like, uh, I was even, I was sort of, at some point I realized about maybe 10 minutes in, and I think I was, when I was watching it, I was texting you, Mitch, I'm like, oh, linguistics actually isn't happening in this talk. So basically my mind switched over and I was just like, pay attention to, and this is maybe more the philologist, like the, the literature side of me, pay attention to how he's phrasing things and how he's wording things. Um, and that was actually, I think, almost more insightful for me because I'm like, oh, there's, it's not just words like solidarity and justice and um, progressive and, uh, you know, um, uh, things like that. It's uh, also things like, uh, just the frequency that these terms are popping up. Um, it, it, it's like, it, it felt to me like there was a quota to be made <laughs> for like the number of times that we have to say this one. So I think I got sent on my, on my, on my camera there. Uh, you know, the number of times we have to say this word, uh, or these words, and it, it almost felt like there was a, there was like a, a quota that had to be met. And it, um, it's a harsh critique, but it really was like, um, yeah, like, like he, he wrote this script as if he's, it, there was like just, a, he, you know, he was taking little tallies. You have to say, you know, solidarity so many times each, each page. You have to say, you know, justice so many times each page. You have to say oppression so many times each page. I'm like, it, it, it felt very artificial, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It did not feel like a real opinion. It felt like um, a performance for not, not to show that look at how great my linguistic knowledge and skills are, but rather look at how horrible I am as a, you know, patriarchal white male. And I am just groveling all the time. And, you know, obviously that's, I think me and Mitch have very strong, a very strong critique of, of that uh, as on an ideological level, but just on like a, on a, on a, on a, like an academic level, that's not really how you should form a talk you you it should not just be genuflecting and groveling you should probably make a point right you were invited to a, a, a conference to talk for a reason so what's your point um I, and I'll, I'll shut up now for a few minutes at least but i just i i didn't even there wasn't a point really i never really got anything out i was waiting for the conclusion and it never really happened this i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah so i i had some big obviously takeaways from this that I would like to dive into, but Please. to, yeah, to yeah. your, to one of your points, um, this comes up every time, you know, these topics come up where in one breath, someone is being self-flagellatory, right? Like shame on me, shame on me. Yeah. And then on the, on the underneath, right on the underbelly, they're actually showing you the savior complex because I've done because of, of things that are without my control, right? Uh, my color of my skin, my, my, you know, all of those things, because of my personal makeup, I am an evil person. And now I'm going to go back and save you all because I'm degrading myself. Right. And this idea that he's going to do this research, which again, as you suggested, it's not really research, but okay. He's doing this research in saying how evil we are instead of letting someone maybe of color do that research and, and and say look how evil you all are right we would cringe at that too right however 
it, it would, would have a little bit more substance. Well, than... it'd be more internally consistent. I, I think maybe one of the reasons, maybe there, there's sort of a, um, this is making me think here, your point's very well, well met. I'm thinking that quite possibly the reason why he as a <laughs> white cis male, I mean, just all the, God, his words, not mine, uh, is doing, feels, feels emboldened and justified to do this is because he recognizes there's sort of an ins- assumption the assumption is that the audience will be cis white. Yeah. Audience, probably male, but female too. But linguistics still tends, I believe I might be right. It does tend more male. I I, I, I believe that's still true for linguistics. Maybe I'm wrong. That used to be at least. It's probably, it's shifting around. But I, I think there's sort of, an, the point is, he's, he's, the assumed audience is not for the non-whites. It's for the whites. It's for, it's for the privileged. And so he's... Um, this is what I was, this sort of comes back to the point of like, this was a, this was a, a hyper performative, almost dare I say, now I am very much predisposed to view it through this lens. Cause this is really what I do when I'm, when I'm, when I'm not pretending to do linguistics, when I'm actually doing sort of the research, I like I wrote my dissertation on. This just seems very religious to me. This is a performative ritual designed to prove something, to prove this is sort of a, a, a conversion narrative, if you will. Uh, you know, this is the standing up in the evangelical church service and talking about, you know, how I quote came to Christ, unquote. But this here, he's coming to justice linguistics, unquote, or whatever what you would call this. It, it, again, I'm predisposed to view it through that lens, but this, I'm like, this is because it wasn't a talk. This wasn't an academic talk. This was something else. Um, and again, it took me about 10 minutes to figure that out. Once I could figure that out, it was more enjoyable because I'm like, oh, you know, I can put on my, at the risk of being uh, patriarchal, I could put on my pit helmet and be like, oh, the, oh, this interesting traditions that, they, you know, I could do my sort of anthropologist thing and like, oh, they, they, they must uh, denigrate themselves publicly, you know, uh, <sighs> when, when that, when, when I made that turn, it, it just, yeah, it, it made more sense. Anyhow, um, do we want to try, and you're the more you're definitely more qualified to do this than I am. Although the little bit of linguistics I did do uh, in my master's program was high, highly corporate, corpus based. So I guess I can, like, I have the most, I have a general understanding of what corpus linguistics is, but I think you're going to be the better person to, to take the reins on this. But let's, for, for the people, for the normies, or at least for the autists who are not linguistic autists, um, what, what is corpus linguistics? Uh, I think we should probably deal with that first since theoretically that's what this talk was about. Right. And, and just very simply, it's corpus linguistics is studying linguistics based on uh, collections of data. So whether it be spoken or written or just massive amounts of, of actual speech or, or uh, writing compiled into a, a searchable database, I guess, that then allows you to go, okay, let me find this word, or let me find this collocation, meaning phrase, uh, it, all kinds of manners in which you can search these corpora to find what you're looking for, and then do some type of quantitative, usually research on it. So how many times was this word spoken by Man, men, uh, men, uh, women is you know something of that nature. Any anything you could think of, you could probably do with uh, with corpus uh, based linguistics. Um, the the largest, most freely accessible corpora in well of English, um, which I found really fascinating because you know as linguists we all have heard of Coca. It's a huge corpus of contemporary American English. And it was made by Brigham Young University. Mitch, did we lose you? They're highly conservative, (laughs) obviously. Um, Highly conservative. Uh, They're run by the Latter-day Saints, right? So uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints. So he like thanked them for using their like, for making this corpus and it's like you realize you're like they're like your sworn enemy right but i just i thought it was funny um it but is yeah a- that's basically what corpus linguistics is which by the way it's now being used in uh, legal studies uh, corpus linguistics is being used in legal studies to go back in history to find okay how was this word in 
when the law was written, how was this word used and what was the true meaning of this word? Yeah, you can uh, do all sorts of fun stuff with corpus linguistics. This is this this our episode here is in no way, shape, or form a, a rag on corpus linguistics. It's pretty neat. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, through the power of computers, you can do a lot of fun stuff. I mean, um, I, I I the corpus the corpora that I tend to look at uh, just uh, again when I'm doing my 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 actual research is just tends to be things like old English corp like corpus all of old English compiled into one searchable database or like um, it, nobody has done old Saxon yet and this is a thing that if I were better at computers I probably would do but I don't trust myself um, so uh, but uh, you know there's like old Norse corpora there's all kinds of stuff like that so for dead languages for modern languages for earlier stages of still spoken languages lots of applications like I said legal applications obviously sort of more straight linguist or sort of pure linguistic, whatever that means, uh, purposes. There's even people, um, it's pretty neat for um, for the, for you literature people out there. There's people who do corpus linguistics for um, authors. So there's um, like, uh, you can like search through all of, if you wanted to, James Joyce's works and try to figure out what the heck he meant in that one part of that one thing and have fun because James Joyce was insane, but brilliant. Uh, so there's all sorts. So even, even for more sort of less pure linguistic pursuits, you can use corpus corpora to, to, to make all sorts of arguments and do all sorts of interesting research about all kinds of things. Um, it's, a, it's again, this, it's, this is in no way, shape or form a, a dig on that. It's a great, it's a great cool technology. The problem is with this, to bring it back to the talk, is that there was actually no real, I mean, I didn't learn, did you, so you are more, I guess I'll put you in the hot seat a little bit more. You're a real linguist. Um, you own that title. You have a PhD in that. Did you learn anything about corpus linguistics from this talk? Because I didn't. So I found it really weird that he would cite blogs and and offshoot studies that he did using corpus linguistics back in 2014. So he, he talked about some of his corpus research, but then said why it was wrong and bad because right. it wasn't socially just social justice driven. It wasn't, it wasn't in solidarity. Yeah. It wasn't ideologically pure enough. Yeah. Right. Um, so yes, it, there was nothing it was situated in corpus linguistics, but there was nothing directly related to corpus linguistics that he was trying to get across, I guess. Yeah. Well, I guess it, the, it was it was it was all a a to take a big massive dump on um frankly, to be honest, science. Yeah. And I I'll get into that later. We'll get but, into yeah, that so. in a few minutes here. Yeah. I um yeah, and I guess just to give people a little bit of perspective, and, and Mitch, you can either corroborate this or disagree with me as you will, but it is not unheard of during academic uh, conferences and during public and in published works, so like articles and books, to say, you know, for an author, a scholar, researcher, whoever, to say, yeah, everything I said previously was wrong because mm -hmm. I found something new. That's actually, that doesn't mean that you're a bad scholar per se, right? In and of itself, that's just, that's a normal thing. It shows you're being intellectually honest. It shows like, okay, yeah, the, the, this, you know, I, I've completely changed my view on this, or I've slightly modified my view on that. That is very normal. And I would argue the sign of a actually good, in and of itself, the sign of somebody who's trying to do their due diligence. And that's why to bring it back around and to do the whole Lutheran nice thing, I don't see him as, I, I don't think he even knows what he's, I don't think he sees what he's doing. I think in his mind, he's trying to do the quote, right thing. The problem is, is he's doing, trying to do the quote, right thing within a framework that as you pointed out, and this will be the transition, hopefully, uh, that essentially undermines all of linguistics, or at least any sort of productive linguistics. Um, and and so that's he's 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 trying to do the right thing in a bad framework, I guess, is 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 how I see it. He's trying to be a thoughtful person in a bad framework. And so uh I I I, I it's one of those things where I feel like. <laughs> it's like a meme. I can save him if you could just nudge him, just like nudge him out of the 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 weird orbit of this obsession with justice, whatever that means, um, and whatever that has to actually do with linguistics. I still I don't really quite understand that. If you could just nudge him out of that, I think he would just start to. I don't know. I I think again, this is sort of just my broader kind of stance on people who are really bought into hyper woke 
ideology is that I do think they're, they tend to be actually nice people. And I think that's part of the reason why the ideology is so strong is because people have a, a lot of people have a genuine desire to be nice, but I think it's all about how you apply it and work it and sort of manifest that in the world. And um, this is just an example of how, when, when your number one priority, I guess, as a scholar becomes pushing an ideology, um, and you don't recognize that that's what you're doing. I mean, you can make an ideological argument about things. I'm not against it. I, of course, have my own ideology. But you, if you're not honest about what you're actually doing, it comes out as this sort of overtly ideological work that everyone who made it or everyone who's watching it or its intended audience don't see it as such. Well, it's just normal. It's just, of course, it's real. Of course, it's true because justice. It's like, okay, that's a philosophical argument, perhaps even a religious argument. But it's not a linguistic argument. It's definitely not a corpus linguistic argument. Because so, Mitch, we've been on, um, again, we'll jump back and then we'll jump forward. Sorry. That's how the brain works. Uh, at least my brain. Um, you've been on before, and I, I highly recommend everyone watch. I'll, I'll probably link it in the description as well. Um, our, a previous t um, conversation that Mitch and I had about Chomsky and linguistics and sort of this universal grammar and this very like hyper theoretical uh, view of what language should be. In many respects, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, but I do, I think I can say this. In many respects, corpus linguistics is a response to that saying, yeah, great. You're like your armchair linguistic, this, that, whatever. Okay. Like, let's actually look at actual language. What do people actually say? What do people actually write? How did the Anglo-Saxons actually write? How did the Romans actually write? Again, you can do it about the past and the present. Um, you know, how do, how do inner city Detroit kids actually talk? Um, right. Like you can make these theories and that's all fine and good, but like, what is it at? What is, what is real? Uh, what is in front of you? What's on the ground? Like it's, you know, pick up the dirt and smell it. Like, what does it smell like? What does the language actually do? Um, and yes, corpus it, linguistics is, is at its heart, anti Chomsky and yes. Yeah, right. But he, that my, I guess my point is he's, uh, he's, you know, he's in, on one hand, he says rah, rah, corpus linguistics, but he's approaching it through such a heavy ideological filter that you're like, are you actually doing corpus linguistics or are you just enforcing another orthodoxy that is hyper prescriptive and hyper like that, that filters out any anomalies in the language? And I can't honestly tell because he doesn't actually talk about any real corpus linguistics. He sort of is laying out an ideal, an ideal literally for what corpus linguistics quote should be. But this should be that he wants that he's laying out doesn't seem very much in the spirit of corpus linguistics at all. It's not gritty. It's not on the ground. It's not on the street. It's not looking through the data. It's not looking for collocation frequencies. It's not doing any of that. It's saying like, we need to find justice everywhere uh, or make justice everywhere. And you're like, well, okay, great. But like, what does that have to do with corpus linguistics? So it, it in some ways it's like alt Chomskyan maybe. It, it, it's at least operating in the same vein or the same, it has the same dynamic as a Chomskyan understanding of linguistics. At least that's my relatively well-read outsider's view of it. So, but I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Well, I, I sort of, I, I want to sort of bring this back to, um, can, can I break down right. what I saw in the- Yeah, no, in no, the... no, well, jumping around is fine. We wander on this channel. <laughs> wandering ling humanists yeah wandering linguists today i i watched the i watched the presentation the first time and i had the same kind of reaction as you as like this is just really cringeworthy all of this i watched it a second time and this time i was trying to read between the lines and i think i finally understood where this came from and that is when he cited one of his works from team that he wrote a blog about um again blogs so you know rigorous but anyway i i digress I mean, if, if anyone's um, read any of my blog articles for carpe form which you all should by the way you'll note that i'm not citing sources i'm not i'm being cheeky like snarky ridiculous there's gifts of like frankie goes to hollywood it's not exactly like my top academic writing because it's not supposed to be right? right blogs are not the same thing yeah so he he did some study about the word bossy and and how that affects gender um and and he was this blog or this research, this meta research was cited by someone else in a publication that he didn't agree with. So, so maybe a more conservative leaning thing. 
And they cited his work sort of again, using the data, like as one would. And he didn't like that. And so as soon as he saw that and he was like, oh shoot, my own research and my own data is being used against me to unvalidate what I'm saying or to validate someone else's thing that I don't agree with. That was when he goes, oh, methodology is flawed. Now we have to go and, you know, we, we can't, we can no longer be unbiased when we're doing the research. We have to put our full bias into it and make sure those people don't get to take our research and spin it into something that it's, that we don't want it to be. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. Pretty much. Yeah. He, he, he got bum hurt because someone, you know, made a point that he didn't agree with based on his research. And he's like, well, this can't happen again. You mean if somebody, hey, if somebody is like referencing my, like some something I've written or something like that online and they're disagreeing with me, I'm like, hey, at least somebody's reading it, you know? Uh, <laughs> wow, what a concept. I don't know. I'd be like kind of thrilled in a way because I guess to me, yes, that's all very, I agree very much. It, it, I mean, yeah, you get, you always get bum hurt when somebody disagrees with you. I mean, this is just part of being a human who has an opinion about anything or, or you know, or, or hopefully a well-reasoned opinion about anything. But I think the ideal reaction to that is to go, oh, well, you know, you thought this, I would still argue this other way. And like, you know, it's sort of a back and forth. And this is, I, it's all very idealized, but this is theoretically what scholarly discourse is supposed to be, is this, this like this give and take, this back and forth, this like, let's talk about it, uh, where, you know, but I think in, you quite rightly point out that he views it almost, well, I don't want to just point him, uh, uh, single him out. I think people on the progressive left, um, whether they be scholars such as this gentleman or anyone they view any kind of debate as total war and there's this idea that like we cannot let them get a foothold here you know if we get let them those others get a foothold here then it's like the rest of the the empire will fight will fall and um i think this just reinforces what we've been talking about that this is so heavily ideologized that it doesn't feel at all uh, i know you're not allowed to say feel in linguistics but i'm not really a linguist so i can say it. it doesn't feel at all like actual linguistic anything it feels a lot like some kind of i don't know i'm gonna be a little snarky i guess it feels like a young turks point a, a sort of montage that's been sort of painted over with an academic veneer but i'm like you're just you're kind of just saying a lot of words, buzzwords, and th the idea is that sort of uh, there's supposed to be applause happening. Yeah, and again, people are that's fine. Have your have your beliefs, but have your political ideological beliefs, but don't spin that off as some sort of corpus hardcore data driven linguistic argument. It's not. It it's it's that's not what you're doing. Um, be honest about that. That's. Like, again, I keep making that point, but I'll make it again. But I, I, the, the, I think the bigger picture and, and you know, pulling out of linguistics, there's the bigger picture of academia in general is this guy, I'll give him a little bit of props because he's saying the quiet part out loud. Yes, I think. they're saying, yes. Being because that he, we know, you and I know, having been in academia for a while, that that's how they did things in the cloak of darkness, yeah. right? So they approach their research, they approach data and, and how they analyze the data. We, we've seen this with, and, and I might get some pushback here. We've seen this with um, climate change stuff, right? So tailoring data and tailoring things to make a point, to make your point, to make your outcome, the, the, your desirable narrative to prove that. That happens all the time. It has happened for decades, probably. Now they're saying, we are no longer going to hide the fact that we've done this. We're going to tell you straight to your face. None of this is objective. None of this is, is uh, anti-biased. You know, we're telling you this is biased. We're looking at it through a particular lens to make a particular point. And we're still going to call it science, even if it's not. Yeah. No, and I think that's, um, again, I, I, yeah, I think that's actually a good thing about this. Um, and I'm actually sort of weird. It's good, but it's scary, right? It's, it's good that they're telling the truth, but it's scary because 
are we just supposed to accept that this is the new normal? Are we supposed no, to accept I, that well, this is science? No, I don't think you should accept it at all, but I am actually thankful. This is a, it's a weird thing, but I am thankful to um, progressives who act like this in a way, because they, they, at least they're, at least, I mean, I don't have to, again, this is clearly not linguistics, but at least I know that it's not linguistics, even though they keep saying it is. And I, and I know what, what they're trying to do. And I, I can see that because he just tells you. Um, I would much rather, it is scary, but I would much rather have that. Uh, and, and it allows us, uh, like we're doing right now, to have a real reaction to it um, than this sort of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, what I really, you know, sort of uh, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. I am, but, but I will pretend like I'm referencing data. Here's some charts and tables. Um, the fact that there were no charts and tables actually was great too, because it's like, oh, you're really not even going to pretend to be doing data-driven anything. I appreciate that you're doing this. Now, obviously, I, I and you as people on the outside of this sphere pick up almost instantaneously on what he's doing. Obviously, that people within the sphere will do the the snaps and the claps and the yay yeah and the yes and all that stuff because it's sort of he's not speaking to us, he's speaking to them. But um again, how many people are really inside this sphere that or the sphere that he's speaking to is probably pretty, pretty small. So I, I do think there's probably just more um normal people out there who are not quite so um ideologically coded in every aspect of their life. And and maybe that's the white pill here. Is it's like, okay. Uh, you, you, or maybe I've just been reading too much Nick Land and I'm like accelerationist at this point. I'm like, well, at least at least he's like, go double down on being a progressive and really follow it as much as you can and look at what that gets you. It, it gets you, it gets you this. Um, the scary part, as you point out, is that it's also gets you kind of a degradation of pretty much anything it touches. And in this case, a degradation of linguistics and you know for the people who watch this show uh we appreciate you by the way maybe the degradation of linguistics you're like well that doesn't affect my everyday life colin and mitch that's the only things that you guys care about care about true granted that's probably also accurate but a degradation of any sort of standard or rigor in in a, a field does have trickle down effects throughout society because it's part of this broader trend towards no standards, no accountability. As much as people on the left, uh, particularly the woke left, care about accountability, do they really care about, do you want to be accountable to what you say? Uh, well, then maybe provide some data for that, right? These kinds of things, I, I do think it's it's just an example of a broader um, broader degeneracy in terms of like men, mental standards, something like that. But so. to bring up, to bring a, up a, an actual linguistic point, um, to this whole notion, what exa you're exactly right. And these progressives are extremely smart in how they are degrading things and how they keep shifting things very slowly and subtly and to the point where a lot of people don't notice. Yeah. So for example, a linguistic thing, the language, it used to be equality, now it's equity, right? Yeah. It used to be, we're doing criticism, right? So criticism was a branch of, of study, like, you know, now it's criticalism, right? So criticalism is all of that CRT, you know, all of that stuff. It, it was tied in with criticism, but it's morphed into something else, right? In his talk, and I think he was completely wrong. He referenced qualitative versus quantitative studies. And I don't think he knew what he knows what those words mean. Let's because, define them. Let's define them really quickly here for everyone. So, as I was taught, yeah, <laughs> I understand. You're the real I'm going to let you do this because you're the real linguist. So you you define it. Yeah. As I was taught, I understand qualitative research to be it's still somewhat numbers driven, but it's like categories of things. So maybe something, for example, um, gender, male versus female, right? A quantitative study is strictly numbers, right? So seeing like a, a proportional, like inverse proportional or directly proportional. Um, uh, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but you, like Those strictly numbers. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. So quantitative is sort of like literally quant like like number quantity quant like like it's a it's a it's just it's it's almost entirely number driven at least in ideally. So right, and so qualitative has some type of like what we in, in we, the jargon we use binning, right? So taking some numbers and putting it into a category, like right. forcing it into a category. That's yeah. qualitative research. I think he was using it as quantitative as anything data driven, and qualitative is well, this is how I feel about it. Right. I'm like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That because that's not data driven at all. Ergo, it's not research. It's not science. So qualitative research in a way he was using it. Yes, I'm going to shun it. That's not research. Yeah. Sorry. No. And that's that's all very good. And I appreciate because you actually I think I, I texted you this when I was watching it and I had forgotten about it and you reminded me. So thank you, because half the things I think of, I forget. And I'm like, I have great ideas and I forget them. So thank you for reminding me. Actually, during the talk itself, and I should have noted the timestamp, apologies, I didn't, I was just busy letting it wash over me and being like, God, um, he actually self-corrects. So this is a, he does this during the talk, he says the word equality and quickly says equity, he corrects himself, and that stuck out to me. Um, I was like, ha, 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 he's enforcing internal orthodoxy within himself because there is been there has been a shift over the past 20 years or so to go from equality to equity and to people outside the sphere those words might mean the same thing where it's all just whatever it's gobbledygook which is true but inside this the the particularly in academia there is a there is a huge difference a qualitative difference in their <laughs> minds between those two words and it was interesting to me that he enforced that uh on the fly he caught himself and um, that is something I noticed. And again, this is this is my, how I view. Uh, this is my you know hobby horse is like oh like this is a very performatively religious action. He said the wrong word. He corrected his words. Most religions have the words you're supposed to say. The words a lot of religions have the words you're not supposed to say. And there's this taboo enforcement thing. You get that all throughout human religious traditions around the world. There's the things you're not supposed to do. The things you are supposed to do. The things you're not supposed to say. I'm like oh this is a taboo thing he did there he said the wrong word it was outdated equality can't have that so equity um so thank you for reminding me that i have yeah i, that I noticed that 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 he does that on the fly i'm like oh, wow and, and this is why i say i'm actually i'm actually kind of really glad that a he did this and b you found it and sent it to me because it's such a wonderful example of hyper performative woke academic speech so i guess for me on a maybe i'm just going hyper meta but I'm like, this is a wonderful linguistic artifact in and of itself in that <laughs> it's so performatively woke, um, but pretending to be linguistics or science or whatever, um, that in and of itself, it's kind of brilliant because it's, it, it really, you, it's, it, it's so honest in some ways um, about what it is. Um, he critiques, uh, he critiques this notion of positive, uh, po uh, if I can speak, positivism um, throughout the uh, throughout the um, the talk, and uh, you know, I, so positivism. The really can't talk today. Positivism. Uh, I have too many languages in my head. This is my excuse. Um, is this notion that like you can, with application of reason and evidence in front of you, can deduce what something is, right? Make a positive claim about something and then therefore also make a claim about what something isn't, right? The, so that, you know, this is the thing, this is not a thing, if you will, to use internet speak. Um, he critiques this notion quite um, harshly um, throughout the uh, talk. Um, and my takeaway is, and I'll be interested to see what you got from it, Mitch, is that his, uh, again, the whole time I'm trying to suss out what his point is. So I'm having to do interpretations of what his point really is. But I think his point is something like that, um, that any sort of hard, uh, if you make a claim about, you know, this X is true about Y language or whatever in linguistics, that you're essentially reinforcing patriarchal oppressive structures and that that's bad and that what we should do instead is kind of just genuinely or like generally talk about what language does but not really make any hard conclusions from any of it and maybe that accounts for the fact that there was no real conclusion to the talk i don't know um <laughs> but yeah he critiques this notion of positive positive positivism 
And for you as a, as a, I, I think I'm just probably, I don't know. I, I'm pretty postmodern in my, in my view of things. And so maybe, maybe I also kind of would critique it as well, but in a very different way, but I am more interested in what you have to say about this a, because you're the guest, but B because you're the real linguist too. And I think my discipline is far more uh, wishy-washy when it comes to this kind of stuff. Whereas linguistics is far more, uh, far more scientific. It's far more um, grounded, dare we say, based uh, in sort of um, evident, like hard evidence, um, particularly what you do in terms of sounds, uh, production of sounds. Um, in some ways, I would argue, and this is a compliment, by the way, that of all the various linguistic subdisciplines, uh, phonetics is the most real in a way, because you can actually measure sound vibrations and you can do what is it the 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 gra the spectra not spectrogram the, the graph things where they the tongue moves and there's like the split face uh, what are those right. called yeah so in some ways it's the most real and the most actual and least theoretical so for you as somebody who is so grounded and based um what is your response to his critique that we that we of of attempting to find conclusions at all well i enjoyed his because I, positivism before, right? I'm not a, I, I, I don't pretend to know anything about, you know, enlightenment or philosophy or anything like that. Yeah. So that was a new word for me. So I was appreciative that he sort of explained it. And so how he explained it in the talk is uh, basically positivism is the thing that he's rallying against. This idea that science or, or research he, unbiased and and um apolitical right and you can't you 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 have to come at research and a question uh with a clear mind and a clear conscience i guess and then he said you can't actually ever be completely positivist like we're human we all have biases and i get that he's absolutely right right any researcher is going to approach a question with some type of bias that's just human nature so then we came with neo-positivism, which is this idea of, okay, we'll acknowledge that we can't be completely unbiased, but we want to be as unbiased as possible. And then, so he takes neo-positivism and says, that's bad too. And I say, why? Like, I still have the question why that he never quite answered in his talk. And so that's why he was saying, throwing buzzwords like ecological supremacy or privilege or something like that. I'm just like, what? You're just making things up now. But I have no problem with neo-positivism. I understood his, you know, his breakdown and, and how we get to this idea of neo-positivism. But that's what science is. And to me, that's what science always should be. And so his idea of rejecting, how can we know anything, right? This gets to that really stupid thing of two plus two is four is white supremacist because is that really... Are there some cultures in like sub-Saharan Africa that don't view two plus two as four, but it's actually 5.65? Like what is going on here? And uh, Yeah, I, I could go on a rampage and I won't do that. So no, that's fine. Rampages are well, uh, it's in the words of Archer, it's a rampage, Lana. Uh, rampages are totally welcome here. Uh, we, this is a place for, for cr constructive <laughs> rampaging. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, thank you. I agree. Uh, and it is, thank you for sharing that. Cause it, uh, Again, I, I was fairly confident I would know how you would respond. But again, um, I try to let people, particularly the guests here, speak for themselves. Um, yeah, I I think this brings us kind of to perhaps one of the main takeaways that I had, at least. And I would be interested to see what you how you respond to this. Um, I think in many ways, he is an example of postmodern left, leftism. I think he's very POMO leftist. And as we, anyone who watches this channel knows, uh, I'm not speaking for, for, for Mitch at all. I'll let Mitch speak for himself, but like uh, me and also Elliot, uh, we're very POMO right. Um, so again, I, I can see that I can recognize the POMO stay. The POMO in me recognizes the POMO in him here. Oh, I see what you're doing. The problem is, is that, you know, postmodern, it's not a requisite for me that you have to be postmodern. I do think it's kind of just the genuinely honest response to the world we live in. But the problem with my problem, I'll make I statements. It's like therapy. I feel uh, like 
he's he's being postmodern and he's trying to find a way out of this enlightenment trap, but he's doing so in the worst possible way. He's doing so in a way that is very leftist in the sense of anti-hierarchy. And when you break down a hierarchy, in this case, a hierarchy of truth, what is true or is not true, what are you left with? Well, you're left, you're left <laughs> with um, just gobbledygook kind of that doesn't really make sense. And then maybe the goal is not to make sense. But then the question follows, what are you, we doing here? Why are we doing linguistics? Why are we attempting to have any field of higher learning or study? What is the point? And if you can't answer that, and I, again, I think you can find um, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern answers to why that are good, but he doesn't supply any of that here. It's just left with post-modern soup, but it never turns into anything else. It's never done. It's never finished. It's never plated. It's never presented. It's never anything. It's just, these are ideas and things, but we can't put them in any sort of uh, ordered system at all because that would be hierarchical and patriarchal and we don't like that so so let's just be let's just pursue justice um which again if you don't have a hierarchy it doesn't make any sense it's not internally consistent or maybe it's internally consistent but its consistency is gook and it's not who wants gook i mean who wants to eat that um in yeah that's um so again i think he's He's critiquing the Enlightenment, which, hey, I, you know, I perk up at because I also critique the Enlightenment. Doesn't mean I'm completely anti-Enlightenment, but there's some definite critiques to be to be made against Enlightenment thinking. The problem is, is that he sort of wants to break the Enlightenment down, but does not want to provide any useful framework to do something different. So you're just kind of left waiting and you'll be waiting until the sun dies of for anything valuable to come out of it. That's kind of, I guess, also a thing I took away from this. But I guess, thought. I guess I'll, I'll just respond to that by saying, what, are, what, what, are, what did we expect? No, I mean, with, it's not, it's with not a, unexpected. Well, but with a, with a, a sect of society, which academia is, that has been so entrenched with by radicals and been run by radicals for so long, and, and and people who are you know communist and ultra progressive, yeah. Um, when we introduce postmodernism to that piece, it's going to become this, right? Like pretty much. That we we could have seen that a mile, you know, from a mile away. Um, I guess the problem is, as I said before, they were doing it so covertly, and now that it's being more overt and more you know the, the the veil is being lifted and it's being infect it's it's now infecting everything this is where i'm in the black pill right so you mentioned white pill earlier i'm the black pill of academia is screwed it's done put a it, fork in it it's done because it is you finish I'll, i'm going to respond to you but you finish I'll, I'll hold my tongue here just you finish it's this it's is why fine. i've i've, yeah. I've run away as fast as I could because I got that PhD and I went, you guys are crazy. I'm out of here because every single person I interacted with was even the people that I knew were smart and, and, and really like ambitious to, and driven, they were going in that direction because that's what they thought they had to do because that's what they were conditioned. Yeah. Think that this is how I get ahead in my field. I'm not going to do that. So I hightailed it out of there. And so it became, it became a black pill for me of no one's going to stand up to it. I can't do it alone. I'm, I'm gone. And so academia is done. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you that it's done. But I, I would, if I may, respond to that. Because I do think a lot about this. And you and I text a lot about this too. And I think at least some of our ideas are halfway interesting to maybe those few viewers out there. Uh, we'll want to hear it from people who are you and I, people who have really been in the belly of the beast and have really um, been, you know, in the belly of the whale. Sounds like Jordan Peterson. It's in the belly of the whale. You have to find your father inside the whale's belly um, <laughs> and resurrect him. Uh, for those of us who have been in the belly of the beast, um, yes, I would agree it's done, but I would quali qualify that um, with a with the point that it's been done for about 50 years and we're just um it's just getting progressively more burnt 
Uh, and so now it's like charred. And so you're like, oh, now it's like really unpalatable. Um, so I, I, um, I think it's gotten a lot worse. It's gotten a lot worse lately, but it's always been bad. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I think it kind of just depends. You and I have different, uh, we have different, I think we agree, you and I on this but about academia, but we have different strategies. My strategy is I am going to try in my own weird it's very weird here. Very weird way. Stay involved as much as I can, as long as it works for me financially, but also um, in the sense that, of course, it's going down, um, right? In in the immortal words of Fall Out Boy, it's sugar, we're going down. But, but while we're going down, we're slowly going down. And I can probably, perhaps this is pie in the sky, perhaps this is my romantic side speaking, but I... I can point to instances of me ha talking to and, and establishing relationships with, with colleagues inside this insane system and with students. And it's not the majority of cases, but there are real instances of where like, we've had like some genuine real academic stuff happen. We've done some actual academic work. I've, I think, you know, had some real honest conversations about spicy topics. Um, okay. Are those the uh, the the majority of instances? No, definitely not. Again, the the sugar, sugar we're going down. The, the the Titanic is sinking, but on the way down, I do think you can do some good on the way down. The trick is, and this is something I'm thinking a lot about lately. The trick is knowing when to hop off. So I know I will hop off at some point because it's because it's not sustainable. It just isn't. But. I totally do not judge people such as yourself. I think you're probably smarter than people like me that you're like, screw this shit, I'm out. You just hop on the lifeboat right away. And for me, I'm like, well, yes, it's going down, but maybe I can save some of like the nice books from the, like the ships, uh, you know, from the from the ships. I don't know if the Titanic had a library, probably did not. I can save some of the books from the, from the, from the library, right? And I have to pick, I can't save them all, but I can hold onto them, wrap them in oil skin and jump on the boat. Um, I, Cause it's going down so slowly. Um, the trick is knowing when to hop off. But again, people hopping off, I think that's probably the right decision. It just, it's, it's a different strategy, I guess. Um, but to, to, to give your point even more credence, when I watch things like this, <laughs> it makes me want to start, I'm almost ready to just be like, let's get in the lifeboat now. Um, I, think, I think part of it too, maybe to, to, to really beat a dead horse and take the, the Titanic um, analogy even further, the problem is, is we need to hop off, but we need lifeboats. And like in the, the Titanic, there's not enough. There's not enough lifeboats. And what do we mean by lifeboat here? There's not enough meaningful, seaworthy, substantial craft that you can go, that academic, intellectual people, whatever your field is, can jump into and not feel like they've just completely given up on, not on academia, it's already going down, but in the life of the mind. You you, you can't, because the, the real mistake, I think, for people who are dissident is to sort of um, devolve into an anti-intellectual framework. That is bad. That 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 provides, I think, woke people with even more of a victory. Um, the the trick is is lifeboats. So make a lifeboat. Work on making lifeboats. Um, right. Some people are going to be making the lifeboats. Some people are going to be manning the lifeboats. Whatever it is. But um, yeah, that's kind of my. I've been thinking obviously a lot, probably too much about this, but. Um, when I see talks like this, it just underscores the fact that, okay, we really need to be making lifeboats. And I will say without tooting our own horn too much or patting ourselves too strongly on the back, I do think it's not gonna change the world, but I think having outlets like we're creating here, like what y'all are doing on carpeforum.com, um, is something it's not like a one, it, 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 it's not one thing that's going to fix the problem. It's going to take a lot of people doing different things, but it's creating avenues for thoughtful, insightful, uh, intellectual activity. That's just not in the ivory tower framework. I think it doesn't fix the world, but it does something. And it's a lot, it does a lot more than I think, uh, and I would never accuse you of doing this, but what a lot of people do, or at least what I see people who've given up on academia do is just completely stop or they just go, screw it. It's all done. I'm like, well, yeah, that's all done. But you, you know, despite all the horrid new speak ideological weirdness of academia, I mean, it does teach you how to think. It does teach you how to, it gives you the skills to research, just take those skills and, and, and employ them elsewhere, which I, again, to, 
the risk of being even more pompous, I think is what we're at least attempting to do here. I would never claim that we are doing it. Uh, hopefully, im yetzah Hashem, God willing, we're doing it. But I think I think that's what we're trying to do here. So to bring it all back around, we have one more one more one, one more time. I, this the instant the talks like this, when I hear people say things like this, uh, it just confirms my sort of stance of yeah, we just need to create other avenues for smart people to be smart, where they're not shackled to, where, where you can simultaneously admit that you're biased because everyone is but not be so shackled to your bias or shackled to your anti-bias that you just end up saying nothing. Um, I don't know. I'll give you, I'll try, I'll let you get the last word in there. A any summarization, conclusions, reactions to what I've said, anything like that? Um, I, I agree. The, I, the question is what what sea debris, uh, to use your metaphor, what sea debris are we making these lifeboats out of? Because they're not being supplied for us. No. So we're, we're going to have to be very, very creative and, and MacGyver our way out of this, it's, if you will. It's going to be, we're going to be doing some water world action here. <laughs> we are going to be water. That's a great movie, by the way. I don't care what you say. We're going to be water worlding the shit out of this. Uh, we, we're going to have gills. We're going to be Kevin Costner and we're going to be finding <laughs> dry land. Yeah, it's going to be great um we're gonna be we have to up, evolve i guess yeah you're we're right. gonna be blowing up radioactive whales and everything oh, i love that movie so much uh yeah no um you know i think what we shouldn't do is um when there's obvious room on the floating board a uh, floating door go sorry jack there's no room for you what the fuck there's room for him right there i'm just gonna die because it's cold and i might as well just let go what sorry titanic was a stupid movie um i guess what i'm trying to say is if there's room on the floating debris and somebody's in the water, pull them onto the debris, right? Uh, if you find somebody who's uh, who genuinely wants to learn and think and explore and make beautiful, cool, interesting things, whether that's physical things, whether that's cool ideas, whether that's good books, poetry, whatever, anything like that, um, find them if you see them and pull them on, on board. And that doesn't mean, you know, Obviously, let them know about the channel here. Let them know about carpetforum.com, but it doesn't have to be just our brand, anything. There are actually a fair number of disaffected sort of post-academics, if you will, out there who are floundering really in the water and 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 the waters of despair. And if you see them, lend them a hand. Um, don't do like the meme and just clap their hand as they drown. Uh, pull them up, right? Uh, and, and and say, hey, we've, you know, it's a ragtag group of survivors, but we've made this crazy raft. Do you want to go on the crazy raft with us? Better than drowning. Oh, yeah. So. And I apologize. To, to take a little bit of my black pill out, I will say to, to, to something you mentioned earlier, and, and I forgot to bring this up. Um, I do understand and I do agree that a lot of our colleagues are suffering from collective illusion, which is, yep. you know, this idea that I am in the system, I have to believe everything they tell me to, and they're doing it for, their, for the sake of their own careers and they, you know, they have ambition and stuff like that, but they're selling a piece of their soul by doing that. And, and they're just under this collective illusion. I did not buy into that. And I still think there's this this glimmer for a lot of these people who are just saying the things that they need to say because they think they need to say them, actually believe them, but that's not helpful. And so I feel like I want to at least try to be helpful by talking about it, by saying, no, you're wrong and pushing yeah. back, rather than just drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I mean, I'll quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, like, I mean, I didn't always used to be like this. I mean, like, even just relatively few years ago, I mean, I was very much drinking the Kool Aid. So, anything, most of like what I was spouting right now, I mean, I think deep down in my heart, I was feeling that something was seriously wrong, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. And I mean, my solution for a long time was to like, well, if you just drink more of the Kool Aid, it'll be better. But it's not better, right? It, 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 it it it's poison right like it, it, don't drink it it's bad for you like and it's one of those things where it's like it's almost like an elimination diet the instant you stop consuming the bad thing you're like wow i like i do feel it's not like everything's perfect but i feel like just more stable it, like mentally i feel more stable um intellectually if you will like i feel like i have a better grounding to push off 
you know, to get to other ideas because I'm not so shackled to, you know, ridiculous things that really don't make sense that you never really believe, but you're just like, well, I guess this is what the orthodoxy is. Um, yeah, I, I think I, 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 I'm happy that I was able to give you a little bit of a white pill because I, I think, I think, you know, the black pill is just not productive. It doesn't do anything. It, it, it's, it's maybe necessary just to point out everything's fucked. Okay. But what do you do now? Right. Um, oh, well, what do you do now? What can you do now? I mean, can you do nothing? I think like I've been outlining, there's some definite things we can do. And you could say, you know, one could say, not you, Mitch, but one could say, well, these alts, uh, ACK, non-traditional, you know, post-academic uh, uh, um, things, nobody respects those. I'm like, yeah, but I don't care about being respected by these people. Oh, oh, well, you're not going to make any money doing that. You don't make money doing academia in the first place. Oh, um, uh, well, you'll never, there's not enough people. Actually, there are. Oh, well, there's not peer review. What do you think we're doing? We have our own group, peer group, and we review them. Now, are they as respected as like something from Cambridge University Press? No, but who cares? See, when you stop caring so much about the, the clout that academia has, that sort of academia TM has, has acquired for itself, then you go, oh, well, we can start actually, weirdly enough, you can start actually kind of recreating what medieval uh, universities were, which was a bunch of smart people hanging out and having disagreements and then figuring something out. Uh, you know, there was, I guess there's the imprimatur, I guess, it, but this sort of like this, this, this intense hold that publishing houses had on how knowledge is, is disseminated or intense hold on like hyper orthodoxy in certain spheres. Yeah. Okay. You can grant there's times where certain ideas were pushed down, but it, it, it's not, it's not like this where it's like a few, you know, a few institutions guide all of thought. Uh, it, it really wasn't. So um, I, I do think you can attempt to recreate, obviously in a completely new way, your own kind of, I don't even want to say academia because the term is so tainted, but a, a, your own kind of intellectual community. How about that? An intellectual community. And I mean, it, again, like in the end, who's really making money on this? Not many people. And who is really getting, I mean, there's no, for people in you and I, um, you're in my generation, scholarly generation, there's no jobs. There's no tenure track jobs out there. Really not. So again, it's like, well, if you're not going to do it for a career, then just do it because you love it. And if you do it because you love it, then do it with other people who love it. And I mean, in the end, is that not worth more than attempting to stay in the system? I would argue yes. Um, I, again, maybe that again, I am pretty POMO <laughs> and that's maybe a POMO way of view of dealing with it. We all have to cope somehow, but I, I feel like it's productive. At least it, 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 it gives you a path forward. So and I would say, you know, despite your perhaps being a little bit more black pilled on it than I am, you're doing the same. You're doing you're doing what I just out you you're the you've been doing this for longer than I have in, in terms of doing the sort of alt intellectual thing. So keep doing that, I guess. I'm trying. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll stop patting our yeah. Uh, sorry, I've bruised you by pat, patting you on the back so hard. Uh, but I I feel like that's maybe a, a hopeful place to end it. Um, everyone who watches we appreciate you i'm sorry that we haven't been putting out uh episodes as frequently as i'd like we're um elliot's busy i'm busy but i can tease a few things that we're going to be doing in the new year i have many plans um we're going to have mitch back on as much as mitch would like uh to do more linguistic -y kind of things uh mitch i'd like to do something with historical linguistics because that was the this, this the realm that i actually had some experience in so we'll have to find a cool topic um i have many ideas uh, I'm considering doing an entire series uh, with a variety of um, both uh, old and new co-hosts on um, monarchs and monarchy uh, this year, uh, looking at monarchs, both mythical and historical. Um, and I believe the first episode will be on Beowulf. So that's going to be pretty cool. Beowulf is a text that's near and dear to my heart. I love the shit out of Beowulf. It's so good. Um, it's going to be great fun. Um, also, uh, I can tease this too. Uh, in about two weeks, I believe, um, me and Elliot and another guest, new guest, are going to be doing a, um, at least one episode, but might turn into a whole series on the politics of Warhammer. Some people such as the distributives have been writing about this lately. And so we also want to, to ride the Warhammer uh, train. And of course, Hen Henry Cavill is going to be doing a new show, which is cool. So uh, there will be some Warhammer happening. 
And uh, yeah, in the new year here, I'd like to, you know, we'll still do the hyper, you know, pretentious uh, philosophical stuff, but I'd like to get a little bit more nerdy, a little bit more pop culture-y. I kind of want that. I have to keep up with Mitch because Mitch, Mitch and Wyatt are also so like topical and the Judge Judy this and the, and the, and the, and the West Hollywood that I feel like I have to, I have to be more on the street with, with the real people. Um, so some lots of cool stuff coming. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, all those things before we go. Mitch, do you have things you want to plug? Because I've plugged, and I should have let you plug first, so apologies, but plug away. Um, we we took a, a short hiatus for um, the holidays uh, for our Thought Criminal podcast, but we will be coming back soon, uh, I promise. Um, so look out for that. As, as we've mentioned, carpeforum.com is a great place to find um, uh, lots of different opinions uh, and, yes. and a lot of older stuff too, but Colin has been putting tons of great uh, material up there as well. Um, so yeah, take a look. And then of course, I, I also write for uh, Outspoken, uh, Outspoken, which is, you know, getoutspoken.com. It's, uh, we have some really great writers over there as well. So lots of things to read and listen to. Yep. And speaking of listen to, if I may, because I just dropped it. So uh, um, me and Elliot recently uh, published our uh, Principles of the Weird Right. If you want to read some crazy, funky, very much Nick Landy-esque uh, style uh, philosophy, put that up on carpeform.com. But as a listening companion, because I am a child of the 90s, I made a Weird Right playlist. Yeah. Uh, it's up on the channel here. Uh, if you want to listen to that while you read along, uh, the playlist takes you from despair to hope. And this is the whole thing. This is what we're doing here. We are we are embodying the white pill. All right. Uh, cool. And with that, uh, I'll let everyone go. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone who watches. And uh, much more to come. Peace, everyone. <laughs>